of the breakout discussions, you'll see some of our good hand signals uh, because we're going to be having an Occupy style breakout discussions for half the day. Um, and so that will be your guide to how you can participate in those discussions. Uh, number two, if you're a registered DC voter, I really encourage you to go out um, and sign the ballot initiative at the registration desk. If you do nothing else to get money out of politics today, um, that is one positive action that you can take. Uh, so I really encourage you to go out there. Uh, number three is please try to keep this space clean. Um, we've got a beautiful church to use today, and I want to leave it that way. Um, so now that all that's over, uh, welcome again. Uh, we have an exceptional conference plan today, and I'm eager to hear from some of the top leaders on getting money out of politics that America has to offer. Uh, we have a group of eight fantastic organizations who supported this conference, as well as numerous speakers and discussion leaders who graciously donated their time. Um, but in the end, today is about you guys, the activists, on the ground who are the focus. Uh, because if there's one thing that the Occupy movement has taught us, is that when regular people unite, we have the power to make a significant impact. Uh, this conference is just one small example of that. Everything you see today uh, is the result of individuals with a single cause united. Uh, this conference and everything that comes out of it is the result of less than a dozen people meeting at coffee shops a couple times a week. And it's proof that the idea that when ordinary people come together, they can do extraordinary things. Uh, but maybe today isn't all that extraordinary because it's a common story. Um, almost every single movement has started this way, with a few committed individuals uh, committed to improving their communities and through that, uh, their nations and even the world. Uh, we sometimes forget that all change starts with individuals, but today is a celebration of that fact. Um, while we spend a lot of time listening to experts and leaders who've committed years of their lives to understanding and working on a single issue, uh, I want all of you to remember that the goal of today is to prepare each and every one of you to lead with the knowledge, passion, and networks that you need to make a difference on this issue. Of course, we'll be focusing our time today on developing strategies for getting money out of politics, but the idea of individuals leading change, leading change is inherent in this topic. The idea that our government should be responsive and responsible to all the people, not just major campaign donors, um, can only become a reality if we as citizens are united in one voice to call for it. Um, and we must recognize that. Uh, we can have our disagreements and political maneuvering on a wide range of issues from seatbelt laws to foreign policy. Um, but first, we have to be sure that the rules of the game are fair. If our electoral system is broken, it's broken for everybody, liberals and conservatives alike. Uh, money in politics may benefit one party or one candidate for a short, term, for a short amount of time. Um, but eventually, uh, it only has one end, and that is to weaken our democracy. Uh, so with the singular idea that we are citizen leaders united across political ideologies to work on fixing the broken political system, I'm going to ask you to do a couple things today. Uh, number one, I want you to spend the time that you have meeting your neighbors, meeting the people who are sitting next to you, uh, because these are the people that are going to be able to work with you to make a positive change in our community. Um, number two, I want us to focus our energy today on productive and positive conversations. Uh, this means that we should spend less time complaining about the broken system and more time thinking about ideas for developing, uh, for, for fixing it. Uh, it means that we should also be focusing on what unites us and not what divides us. Uh, and that is our united goal to make government responsive to the people that it's supposed to serve. Um, <laughs> It's not just an idea, but a collection of collective action taken by a nation. 
Um, and it's our responsibility to demand that our government serves us um, and to join each other in sculpting and building a better nation. Uh, so, with that idea of cross-partisan political cooperation and citizens uniting um, to make a difference in our communities, uh, I, I want to introduce our speaker, uh, Stephen Erickson. When we started putting this conference, we wanted to reach out to people with a, a broad range of political ideologies who were interested in reaching uh, across these party lines and these divides that, that we've constructed. Uh, and then we were thrilled when we found uh, Steve. He, he's, a, he's a citizen activist like many of you. Um, he's been a conservative activist um, who's been focused on this cross-partisan dialogue, uh, and, and especially on, uh, on making democracy more responsive to people. Uh, he's the president and founder of Americans United to Rebuild Democracy, which is an alliance of conservatives, liberals, and centrists. Um, who are working on this issue. Uh, in addition to that, he's, he's worked for comprehensive political reform, including clean election systems, congressional term limits, and an end to gerrymandering. Um, he's a writer and a historian uh, who's worked with a number of organizations, uh, including the Cato and the Heritage Foundation. Um, he's, he's, he's very educated about this issue, and I'm really excited to have him give the introduction uh, that, that's going to set the tone for the day and to give us a good overview on, on his thoughts of, um, of, of how we should be thinking about this issue. So, without any further delay, I want to introduce uh, Stephen Erickson. Self-evident truth number two. 
our political leadership sucks. <laughs> we all know them. They're, they're, they're focused too much on their next re-election and not enough on the next generation. Too often they care more about uh, their own political power than they do public service. In public opinion survey after public opinion survey, we see the same thing. Um, in terms of integrity, the American people rank members of Congress down there with, with used car salesmen. So, uh, poor political leadership. The third self-evident truth is that elections in the United States of America are fundamentally unfair. Now, uh, the public approval rating of Congress uh, is, is for many years fallen below 20%, and lately the approval rating is like 9, 11, 13%. At the same time, 87% of all members of the U.S. House are guaranteed re-election. 87%. It's been that way for 50 years. Is this self-evidently something is wrong here? Self-evidently, the incumbent political class has entrenched themselves in office, and we no longer have a level playing field uh, in American elections. So, if we put all these, these self-evident truths together, what do we have? We have a crisis. Our, our, our democracy is under attack, just as surely as if. Uh, a foreign power were under attack, were attacking our democracy. And in some ways, it, it, it might be better if a foreign nation were attacking our democracy, because at least then we would know who the enemy is. And at least then we would stop pointing the finger at each other. To use another analogy, the, corrupt, the, 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 the corruption that is destroying our system is like a cancer. Of course, cancer must be completely ripped out. You can't just take out a piece of it. And that's, that's why um, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about the campaign to uh, reverse the, the infamous Citizens United decision and uh, the constitutional amendment process to go with that. I don't know if you had a chance to read out of that next piece in the Atlantic, but as, as Professor Lessig points out, um, the, the corruption of our political system began long before Citizens United. The, the corruption that led to the entire financial crisis, the, the manipulation of, of, of our politicians by Wall Street through, through big campaign do donations, all of that occurred before Citizens United. So, to reverse Citizens United, you're going to uh, require a constitutional amendment, which is about the hardest thing to do in American politics. A constitutional amendment takes an enormous amount of time and money and effort. Uh, it, it's an incredibly hard thing to do. So, for those of you who are really intent on this approach, I just have one question for you. Why would you go to all that time, effort, money to pass a constitutional amendment that isn't going to fix the system? It might fix a small piece. Mind. But it's not going to fix the system. At the same time, I'm afraid that if, if this is the approach going forward, you, you probably won't have the support of conservatives. Conservatives and progressives will probably remain apart at the grassroots level. And my fellow citizens, that is exactly what the people of this town want. They want to keep us apart. Now, in the 1990s, I worked at U.S. Terminals, I wrote articles for the Heritage Foundation and for the Cato Institute. And I can tell you that the establishment in this town has betrayed all of us. You may remember the contract with America. The last item on it was terminals. But the contract had some fine print. They didn't promise to pass terminals. They promised a vote on terminals. And there were three different term limits proposals. So every politician that wanted to be perceived as supporting term limits could vote for it, but yet never pass it. Then the establishment has betrayed progressives as well. In the last Congress, Nancy Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi, had promised to bring the Fair Elections Act to a vote, which would have created a public funding system similar to those in Connecticut, Arizona, and Maine. You never got that vote, did you? 
So, so what we need to appreciate, I think, is that the, the Republican and political establishments in this town basically stand together to defend the status quo. And because they do, it is absolutely critical that we manage to unite as grassroots progressives and grassroots conservatives and everybody in between. Now, I, I do come here as a conservative, but I, I'm not here to urge you to be more conservative. Now, far from it. I urge you, I beg you, I plead with you to be more radical. Let's create a constitutional amendment that addresses all of those self-evident truths that I outlined at the beginning. We're not going to agree on many things, the size and all of government, healthcare system, climate change, social issues, foreign policy, that's fine. We don't even need to talk about those things. And, and I wouldn't ask any of you to violate your principles, because I wouldn't respect you if you did. And, and, and grassroots conservatives, we're not going to violate our principles either. But the good news is, when it comes to these essential reform issues, we are really, really close. We don't have to compromise our principles, not. We, we might have to make small, small principle compromises, but, but on the essentials of the, of the problem, we agree. We simply need to create a process by which we sit down together and, and, and build a movement together and that, that's what my particular organization is all about. Um, and I hope you'll, uh, you'll come to one of my workshops either this morning or this afternoon so I can tell you more about our, our proposal. Well, again, it's, it's great to be here. I'm looking forward to talking to you throughout the course of the day. And I want to thank you all for your civic mindedness and your patriotism. Let's rebuild democracy together. Thank you.
President Obama himself raised over $750 million in 2008 and is likely to meet or exceed that this year. So these goals make it almost certain that neither party's nominees will accept public funds for the general election or the spending limits that come with them. And this is why we really need to be aware of this and this is why our panelists are here this morning. So I want to um, introduce each one of them. First we have Mariah Blank, who is the moderator and she is part of Occupy DC's talk show radio, which is the first radio for the occupation movement. And it's called Voices of the 99%. Um, and then we have... <laughs> Mr. Rob Warner, who might be in the audience, that's great, for Americans for Campaign Reform. Congress who have 
who come to our cause and have supported uh, a system of public funding elections. Um, that is our ultimate goal as an organization. That is our, our singular focus. Uh, we've been working very hard in Congress on the Fair Elections Now Act. Um, but let me, let me talk for a few minutes uh, in terms of where we find ourselves and what we can do right now, including a uh, uh, most immediate uh, opportunity uh, to our north. Um, so I would very much agree with Steve that we find ourselves in a situation where our democracy is broken, our Congress is unresponsive. And why are they unresponsive? It really has to do with money because they are completely dependent on it. And it's not a situation even, if, you, if any of you heard the uh, an NPR report uh, recently, um, it's not so much that um, the lobbyists are pursuing elected officials anymore, it's that the elected officials are pursuing the lobbyists in order to solicit the money they need. You know, Alan Simpson likes to tell about uh, uh, his time in Congress where, uh, you know, you, you want to be talking to your colleagues the day before a bill comes, uh, you want to be talking strategy with them, but you can't find them. Where are they? They're fundraisers, whether it be here in D.C. or across the country. Um, the average U.S. senator is spending about a third of their time raising money. And that's not what we elected our officials to do. It's not what we elected them to do for us. It's not what we elected them to do for our country. So we have a, a situation where we are, that is completely dependent upon money. We also have a system that um, forecloses the opportunity to run for Congress and to represent uh, our democracy to um, many people who have talent. I mean, look at all the people in this room. Uh, you have something to say. You have something to add. You may be a successful business person. You might have created a small business and made a huge success out of it. You might uh, be a wonderful community activist. But in order for you to run for Congress and to bring your talents to the table, the system is pretty much foreclosed to you unless you have deep pockets yourself or have wealthy friends or have achieved perhaps some notoriety because you're famous in some way, or maybe by being successful. But even those people cannot come to the table with the money required these days. If you think you can represent your state or district in Congress, and the first thing that often happens, or mostly happens when you talk to the professionals is how much money do you have? That's the gate. You can't pass that gate, go home. And this is just very corrosive to our democracy. So there are a couple things that uh, I think we need to do now. Uh, one, uh, somewhat small but important in terms of the overall problem we face is that we have a Federal Election Commission that's completely broken and uh, really doesn't add anything, any regulatory head at all to the system. The President has the opportunity to bring forward five very qualified uh, nonpartisan individuals. And yes, he may get a fight for it, but he hasn't done it. He needs to do that. He needs to take some leadership on trying to make the FEC uh, a workable body. Number two, we need transparency and disclosure. Um, and, you know, historically, conservatives have rejected uh, public funding elections as an approach, uh, maybe for some philosophical reasons. I'm glad to see that Stephen is a conservative that is supportive of it. Um, but they have always said, and a long line of leaders in Congress, Republican leaders in Congress, have said, we should be able to spend all the money that we want or we need to, or we should, we should be, that should be your right. But let's find out where it comes from. So now we have the worst possible situation. We have all this money floating around the system, and it's completely uh, unknown, under, uh, there's no disclosure about it. There is legislation in Congress now, uh, the Disclose Act 2012, which I, I think is an improvement over the original version. Um, we are trying to build bipartisan support in the Senate. I was uh, meeting with several 
folks yesterday and continue to do that. Reach out to the other side of the aisle and see if we can find some allies. There are folks in Congress on both sides of the aisle who care deeply about this issue, and there are folks on the Republican side of the aisle. But I think they, even those folks feel caught in their system, caught within their uh, respective caucuses. I think it's, again, very corrosive as a body politic and as a society where we find ourselves even in trying to find common ground. Because if you're a Republican legislator and you sincerely reach out to a Democrat to try to solve the problem, to try to find that common ground, and you're punished by your own party by doing that, and vice versa, it works both ways. That's not going to help anybody. That's not going to solve anything. We have to get beyond that kind of behavior. But I do think that money even has so much to do with um, how we even talk to each other. Because again, Congress is so dependent upon it. So, FEC uh, disclosure, constitutional amendment, uh, if it's fashioned well and correctly, it's a valuable thing to do. But what we really need to do, in our view, is to pass a small donor public funding election system for this country. And I think breaking that link between large donors and special interests and moving our system from that, the present system, to one where citizens are more involved, citizens find more of a connection to the people that they elect uh, over time, I think will greatly aid the health of our democracy. We have an opportunity uh, to work on that right now immediately in New York State. If anybody here is from New York, I believe there are some. Governor Cuomo, in his State of the State address in January, indicated that he was very interested in bringing forth a public funding relations system for the state of New York. Um, that's, that uh, effort will be ramping up now. The second half of the session goes to June. We expect the governor will be coming out with a proposal later this month. Um, there's a wide, uh, growing uh, grassroots and business coalition uh, forming in New York to press for this. It's important for a couple of reasons. It's important for New York State, but it's also important for the nation. Because if New York passes a public funding election system, the second largest state in the nation, that will garner huge attention. We're not going to make a lot of progress, probably, in this particular Congress. But we can keep trying and build those bridges and see where we can get in 2013 and 2014. But if New York can do this now, it will send a strong signal. So any of you from New York, please get involved with that. Anybody who knows anybody in New York, please get involved with it. Because it is, it is vitally important to um, our movement. Thank you very much. Thank you. I woke up this morning at four o'clock in Boston. It's good to be here. It's good to be anywhere. <laughs> My campaign and I went to the Red Sox game yesterday. I have to confess it's hard. Stadium and it went way too long, but I'm really honored to be here. And I want to thank you, each of you, for your efforts and your attention, not to me, but to something a lot bigger than me, and that is the future of our country. How do we regain our democracy? How do we make our republic do what Benjamin Franklin asked us to do? Keep strong. Because there are no guarantees about a nation. There are no guarantees about liberty. There are no guarantees about speech without the shadows of the special interests. And that's what this battle is about. Um, I see a country that I love in serious trouble. There were a billion cell phones. 
was made in the world last year. None were made in America. We've lost approximately 10 million manufacturing jobs, not just to Mexico, but primarily to China. And it was done deliberately. It was done by special interest who wrote the tax code where we pay the cost of building plants overseas. We pay it, the taxpayers. What kind of nation is that? I'm a banker by profession. I'm a small bank, not a billion dollars in size. It's more like 750 million. Pretty good size for a little state like Louisiana. And, and this, this was said in the introduction, we didn't foreclose on any mortgages. We didn't take bailout money. We're profitable. We're prosperous. We work hard. But I look at bank reform. What a joke. I mean, I picked up the New York Times this morning at 5 o'clock at the airport, at Logan Airport. And on the back pages on B3, I ask you to read it if you get a chance to. There's a little article that says, Blank Fines Pay Cut 35% as Goldman Sachs struggles. My heart bleeds. <laughs> It's a million dollars a month. But read the fine print. By the way, Goldman Sachs was one of those banks that lied to Congress. We don't need any federal help. They took hundreds of billions of taxpayers' credit, paid not one penny for it. Oh, we don't need your help. We're just going along to not, so the other banks don't look bad. That's what he said, a lie. Their stock is down 46% this year. So, Lord to pay cut. But then you read the fine print. Let me read it to you. His 2011 pay, including stock deferred, is 16.2 million, not 12. Up from 14.1 million the previous year. Now, this is what happens in our society, where the average woman and the average man is working to make ends meet, is trying to hold on to a job or find a job. We have 13 million people unemployed. We have another 10 million people who've either quit looking or working part time. We've got 25 million Americans who could have a decent job and need one that don't have a shot. And these guys have feathered their nest at the taxpayer's expense. And then the final little fine print in the article, I couldn't think of when I read this, about 515. It says, in their shareholders meeting this year, certain shareholders have, have proposed that Goldman Sachs policy and procedures governing the lobbying of legislators and regulators be fully and accurately disclosed. Guess who's opposing that? Lloyd Blankfeld and the board of directors of Goldman Friggin Sachs. <laughs> now look, I'm not picking on Wall Street banks. That's a business I know. And I know it's hollow as an empty egg. I know that America doesn't come first. I understand they're in the profit business. I understand that, so is my bank. But we have a system now where you did bank reform two years ago. The president signed the bill, President Obama. He runs to Wall Street the next week, has a fundraiser at $35,000 a ticket, and it's hosted by Goldman Sachs. You get it? Goldman Sachs is bigger now than when the crash came. You remember too big to fail? Well, the big banks are bigger now under the regulation of this federal government. We are a joke. We are a nation still vulnerable to a financial collapse. This is the weakest recovery in American history. 
weaker than the Great Depression recovery. We've averaged for the last three years 1.7% annual growth. The annual growth in this country for the last 70 years has been 3.4%. We have millions of young people out of work. And be born black and look at the unemployment rate in America. It is a disgrace. And what has this administration done? Just like the Bush administration made a deal with the Wall Street banks. Oh, you come first. No, they don't. We won't do bank reform. We won't do health care reform. I'm a diabetic. I've been a diabetic for more than 40 years. We need health care reform. Many people in America cannot afford to be sick. But did we do anything to lower the cost of health care? Oh, no. This current administration made a deal with the insurance companies. They have a monopoly in each of 50 states. You can't buy medical insurance across the state line. Did you know that? It's prohibited by law. They made a deal with the pharmaceutical companies. It was about money. The president calls the head of the Pharmaceutical Association. He told me this. And he said, look, Billy, if you don't oppose health care reform, we will protect you in the bill. Read the bill. It protects pharmaceutical companies from price discount. It is against the law for them to price discount. It protects them from, from international trade from Canada. In the bill, all the cost of health care, insurance, what a mess. What a regulatory mess. It's not competition. It's not transparent. All are protected in Obamacare, in affordable care. And they shouldn't be. Why would the president's team do that? They're not evil people. Money. Money. Either money they take or money they're afraid of. Here's my proposition. Now, I admit that I'm a Harvard graduate, and I never say that in Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> I went undergraduate there and studied economics. John Kennedy got great. I then went to the Harvard Business School and studied finance. And I'm proud of growing jobs. That's what I do. When I became governor of Louisiana, the unemployment rate was 12%. When I lost my re-election, it was 6%. We put people back to work. We did the hard things. We balanced the budget. We reformed taxes. We tested school teachers. We passed the toughest campaign reform law in America, and it's still there today. And we've elected Democrats and Republicans. We put people in jail. I used to be six foot two and smile a lot. This is tough. But all the things that you and I want to do, left and right, liberal, Progressive, conservative. All the things we know need to be done. Tax reform, budget reform, health care reform, banking reform, immigration reform, trade reform with China. I can go on and on. None of these will get done by Mitt Romney or Barack Obama. Because the special interests own this town. Let me say it another way. Now, I'm the only guy running for president who's been elected a congressman and a governor. I'm the only one. This town is not just broke, it's bought. The solution will include full disclosure. The 
solution will include a tight reporting period for that disclosure. I suggest 48 hours. Now they can hide donations for a year. The solutions will include shutting the lobbyists in their checks off from political fundraising. The solutions will include limiting PACs to no more than individuals, whatever the individual rate is. In my campaign's $100, you might want it at $2,000. Full disclosure, 48 hour reporting. PACs can't give more than whatever the individual limit is. You know what the law is now? Twice as much. 5,000 for PACs. I will eliminate super PACs. They're clearly illegal by the Supreme Court. And I will include criminal penalties for politicians. Everybody here most of you in D.C. except for New Yorkers over here. 
How many are from DC? Okay. So, how many of you are tweeting since you got this tweet thing going? Go ahead. So, the DC Public Trust, how many from DC Public Trust? Okay, DC Public Trust is organizing and gathering signatures to put an initiative on the ballot so that in the District of Columbia it would be illegal for corporations to make direct political contributions to candidates. This is not the independent stuff that Citizens United authorized. In DC, it's legal for government contractors, say, in business, that you direct con uh, campaign contribution to the mayor, and not surprisingly, it tends to corrupt our process. So, a really good thing for people in DC to do is to get connected to DC Public Trust and help gather some signatures so we can get this thing the ballot and clean up in a small way DC politics. There's tweeters, DC Public Trust. And I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay, so how, how bad is it? Now, it's really, really bad. Um, and to help you recall, so we're going to experiment and see if I can get you chanting a little bit. So, and I'll illustrate the chance, so it's not just sort of a, a cheerleading thing here. But, and I'm going to, the system of campaign spending was completely broken before the Citizens United decision came down. I mean, we have a fix for Citizens United, we've got to make sure the fix is not just the narrow decision, but the whole broken system. But Citizens United itself created a serious problem, massively worse than the already corrupt process. So the first thing that Citizens United has done has enabled a tidal wave of corporate and super rich money to come into the process. So just to help you remember this, just champion a tidal wave of money. A tidal wave of money. You gotta do it until you get this. A tidal wave of money. What's the tidal wave of money? In the 2010 elections, $300 million came into independent organizations. Those are the things that are enabled by Citizens United, like Carl Rhodes Operations of the Chamber of Commerce. That is more than took place in the mid-year elections in the previous 20 years combined. In the 2012 election, Carl Rhodes Operations are planning to raise $250 million. They got a $10 million secret donation yesterday, two days ago. Right, just, just, in, just reveal. $250 million for Carl, for Carl Rove. Koch brothers said they're going to spend $200 million. They likely will go more. The Chamber of Commerce has been no way they're going to be out spent by these guys. Also, at least a quarter of a billion dollars. So just in those three entities, we're talking three quarters of a billion dollars, a billion dollars, just for those three entities. So the Obama campaign is going to raise this outrageous amount of money. They hope for a billion dollars to come out this year. But just these three sources are going to match it. So that is indeed a tidal wave of money. Second thing is, in the citizens, post-citizens United world, is that secrecy matters. Secrecy matters. Okay. There we have actually a pretty good system of disclosure for most campaign spending. If you're an individual contributor, your money that you spend, the money that you donate is going to be disclosed. Corporations and people kind of and the money the super PACs is disclosed, it's disclosed to late money is disclosed. But most corporations are not giving to the super PACs so far. Corporations are giving to organizations, independent organizations that don't have to disclose their funders. And the reason it is for this, which the head of the Chamber of Commerce says, the head of the Financial Services Roundtable says, they all say, they don't want to be targeted like Target was after they gave a donation to an anti-gay, anti-choice governor, gubernatorial candidate in Minnesota. And they're seeing it again now in the campaign against Allen. So they are very scared of being held accountable. So they will not make their donations publicly. They will make it private. They will channel the money through the Chamber of Commerce, through the secret operation of Carl Rove runs, or the Coke Rose runs, through all kinds of operations. And if it is disclosed, actually we'll be able to cut back on the corporate spending. Not the money from the super rich who are doing it publicly, but the corporate spending, which can be orders back to more, we can actually cut back. Third thing is that all the outside money is fueling an attack ad avalanche. I think some of my metaphors are the other way around. Attack ad avalanche. 98% of the money from this Romney super PAC went into negative, it's gone into negative advertising. In the Illinois race, state, in the Illinois Senate race in 2010, 7 to 1, there was about 15 billion outside money came into that race. 7 to 1, spend on negative ads. The reason is negative ads work. Candidates are inhibited from running negative ads because you look bad if you run a negative ad. But if you are Americans for a better tomorrow tomorrow, <laughs> or a 
Americans for Solutions or Americans for Prosperity or Americans for Jobs, all real names, not just this first Stephen Colbert one. No one knows who you are. You don't care if anyone knows who you are. You're not really accountable, so it doesn't matter. So you run these negative ads and you have a huge impact on the race. Also, not so incidentally, you massively turn people off to the electoral process. And that, that benefits the plutocrats and the corporate interests. That's a huge, huge factor because the main way people are going to experience all this money, where regular American people are experience all this money, is through this unbelievable avalanche of negative ads that's going to take over the airwaves for all of October, probably most of September of this coming year. The fourth thing is corporate candidates win. In the 2010 elections, there were, a lot was going on, obviously. It wasn't just all this outside money. But the outside money backed the winners in 60, 60 to 75 races where power changed hands. So money actually matters in elections. It affects who gets elected. And that fact itself has a huge impact. Just because we change the, con the, the constitution of the, the Congress, or who's in Congress. We change who's thinking about running for Congress we change what the people who are in Congress will do. So the last point is the chilling effect from all this outside spending. The chilling effect. <laughs> so people don't, if you're a member of Congress, just like what you were saying, even you, you censor yourself. And you know the consequence. What you want more than anything to be reelected. And you know if you've gone up against big interest, you may have a massive independent expenditure drop on you that can throw you out of office. Peter DeFazio, a member of Congress from Oregon, running a relatively safe seat. He supports a tax on Wall Street transactions, a very good idea, uh, Wall Street speculation tax. All of a sudden, he finds in 2010 elections, some independent group is spending $600,000 against him. The independent group has exactly two funders. One of them is a Wall Street guy, who's like the fact that Peter's running this campaign for Wall Street speculation tax. So Peter is able to hold a seat, he's in a free safe seat, but an unbelievably powerful message for other members of Congress about what happens if you do the wrong thing. And everybody knows, everybody knows this is how it works. Everybody knows it's become much tougher to take on corporate interest because the consequences to you as an elected official may be the most severe you're going to lose your job. Not too many are willing to put their jobs on the line. So, okay, the system is really broken, things are really bad. What do we, everybody agrees with us, but we can't get anything done. Do we do? um, there's a lot to do. There's a long reform uh, agenda that needs to be enacted. The public citizen will work on a whole range of things from these, these technical FEC things to public financing, stronger disclosure, making sure companies can disclose to shareholders and get approval from shareholders before they spend. But the issue that's going to build a movement that's going to get, in my view, the issue that's going to build a movement that is going to take on this issue and ultimately get us to where we need to be is the, is the call for a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United, get money out of politics, overturn the principle invented by the Supreme Court that money equals speech and that corporations have a right, have rights like real life creating human beings. On the other hand, it's a big and audacious idea that expresses exactly what people think already. They don't think that corporations should be treated like people. They don't think that money is speech. They understand that corporate spending buys elections. They understand that the system in Washington, as well as the state houses and city councils, for the matter, is tilted on behalf of corporate interests and exactly because of all the outside spending that comes in. So the pe people are with us, but what we have to do is get people organize and mobilize, and they get excited around a big idea like they're never going to be excited around FEC reform. Although FEC reform is a big deal, i got to tell you, it's, it's the most dysfunctional thing I've seen. So, uh, with a number of other organizations, Public Citizen is organizing a nationwide effort to get state and local resolutions passed supporting the Constitutional Amendment. We've got a quarter of the Senate that's already on the board for a Constitutional Amendment by the end of 2012. We're going to have a third of the House of Representatives supporting the Constitutional Amendment. President Obama says he supports the Constitutional Amendment. And we are, in fact, going to win the Constitutional Amendment. But it's going to take a huge, huge amount of work. Uh, 
Um, the next thing on the agenda is a big collaborative effort called Resolutions Week. So for you guys tweeting or taking notes, resolutionsweek.org, please get connected up with that. It's an effort to have res local resolutions passed across the country, including here in Washington and the Washington area, um, in the month of June or afterwards if we can't get it done in June. And that's, I think, going to help build more and more support. It's going to evidence how much support there is for a constitutional amendment. It's going to help build a movement. It's going to give them something concrete to do. It's going to get some real wins. It's going to demonstrate the growing demand for a constitutional amendment. It's going to push Congress, more members of Congress, to sign up for a constitutional amendment, support a constitutional amendment. And that itself is going to feed into a virtuous circle until we ultimately win this thing. I have to say, the system is so bad, even though the constitutional amendment, the best argument against the constitutional amendment is that it's really hard. But the fact is, we don't have an alternative. So, if you listen to Buddy and you hear how the system's broken, he goes to the list of reforms that meeting, and he's right. He said, well, we can't win these things unless we fix the money and politics problem. If you say we're not going to fix the money and politics problem, you're giving up. So, you guys are here, but you don't believe in giving up. Giving up is not an acceptable option. So, we've got to take on this constitutional amendment project. And I, I'm really optimistic and confident that we're going to get it done. We've had much more momentum, much more success in the last two years, particularly in the last six months, than I would have thought possible. And this thing is going to take off. So, last thing. The D.C. people, D.C. Public Trust, get involved in this really local, top priority effort to clean up D.C. politics, and the big national thing, the resolutionsweek.org. Now, Public Citizen will organize our campaign um, for constitutional amendment around the radical proposition that democracy is for people, not democracy is for corporations, ruled by them. The, def right, the definition of democracy is ruled by the people. So we thought we would reiterate that. The Supreme Court seems to have lost sight of that. Democracy is for people.org is our website. If you want to do one last chant, because I know you guys are really inspired by this chanting thing, <laughs> if you do democracy is for people, reiterate our kind of core truth about how our country is supposed to work. So democracy is for people.